The following podcast is intended for people who are intent on growing their business. And welcome to Innovate Marketing, where we are bringing you interviews with the people that are making waves in the world of marketing, branding, and business growth. I'm your host, Sean P. Neal, and we are brought to you by MyPodcast.media. So if you're a brand and you're considering podcasting or even revamping an existing podcast, make sure you visit MyPodcast.media. Now we've got a great show for you today, so without further ado, let's get into it. Think for just a minute about all of your online activity for the business that you run every single day. Think about it for your marketing. If you're in marketing, think about it. If you're an agency, think about it for your customers. Think about it for the leads that you acquire. Think about it for your social media. What does security and privacy mean to you? Or better yet, maybe the question is, what does a lack of security and privacy mean to you? That's what we're going to talk about today with John McNulty, CEO and co-founder of DigiBridge. So without further ado. John McNulty's career began with the Gillette Company, where he ultimately had national responsibility for Gillette's most important global account, Walmart. After Gillette, John served in senior leadership positions, including serving as president of McGregor Golf Worldwide, senior vice president of Brunswick, vice president general manager of Kodak, vice president of Wilson Sporting Goods, and director of national accounts at Alberto Culver. Since 2007, John has been CEO and co-founder of DigiBridge, a marketing technology and consulting company serving the needs of both large and small companies and agencies. Do you think the average person that's using a device right now at this minute is aware of the things that are going on around them? Like what, what's, you know, what is the level of awareness out there for the average person? That's a great question. Because it's uh, it's beginning to improve, okay? But I would say overall people are not aware of what the public internet really is. You know, from the DNA of the public internet, it was always meant to be mineable and shareable. That, that's the DNA of it. It's not telecom. Like your, your, your cell phone and your home phone, that's a different medium. That was never really meant to be mineable. And, and there was very strong laws put in place early on, you know, by the telecom industry and the, and the FCC to make sure this is not mineable. I mean, unless you want to go get court ordered subpoenas and wiretaps and all that stuff, right? So along comes the public internet. It's a medium of communication, but the DNA of it from day one was meant for it to be mineable and shareable. So, so as a starting point, we try to help people understand whether it's people or whether it's businesses. We speak a lot at, in college classrooms. We speak a lot at in, industry events, try to make them understand that a, any and all communication that flows through the public internet is likely to be mineable. And the capabilities to do that are accelerating exponentially now with this next generation of AI. Okay, wow. you know, they're 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 firing it up at a rate now, a, a mineability rate, you know, um, that is beyond comprehension almost. So that, that's what we try to make people understand. They anything going through the public internet it is subject to mineability and shareability and weaponization and stigmatization and all the other nefarious things that go along with it. And marketing, of course. Um, you know, and, you know, lead generation and, you know, we can get into that later, but uh, it's people are beginning to understand it more and see now you have to help accelerate this understanding. There's an element of anxiety that's now being entered into the equation that's coming from the, the global digital privacy revolution, you know, laws you know, launched initially by the European Union GDPR, uh, privacy protocols. They they kind of embarrass the United States now into launching our own laws here in the U.S. We have 16 states um, that that the attorney generals of the states 
uh, have now launched their own digital privacy laws, and there's many more states following. We have our Justice Department involved, our Office of Civil Rights, OCR, involved. We have the Securities Exchange Commission involved, the FC, the FCC, the FTC. And, you, you know, you see the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and other publications almost every day talking about privacy you know, and, and trying to create awareness. So it, it's, to your, your question, to what extent are people aware? I, they're becoming more aware, I, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll put it that way. Well, and this is all, you know, happening every day while I, you know, pick up my laptop to, you know, read the latest Wall Street Journal or whatever article, like all of these things are happening in the background. Uh, I, I want to talk for a minute because you, had your roots and i don't even say necessarily your roots but your your background is kind of fascinating to me and you had talked to me about coming from i think it was kodak was that was that right you, you yeah kodak yeah kodak. I, was, I was the vice president general manager at kodak um where we actually were one of the first companies to um market through the cloud okay we didn't call it the cloud at that time we called it images in the sky so we, because before we were doing that, we were really, you know, we thought we were the first, okay, um, to really create awareness for a so-called cloud communication marketing enterprise. Um, and, you know, pic there's no nothing more private than your pictures, if you think about it, right? And to really go back, if you think of how you used to pick your pictures up, you know, before digital, right? You know, you went into Walgreens or CVS, you know, or Walmart or whatever, and um, you know, you drop your pictures off. They, 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 and they had them produced. Um, <clears throat> you know, you brought your film in. You know, your thirty-five millimeter film. They had them produced. <clears throat> you come back in three days, and the pictures were in a little bag, right? And beside your pictures, there's your neighbor's pictures. So think about that. And you can yeah. look right down and you can see the name on the little bag, your neighbor's pictures, right? So people, all the, you know, what people have started to do is they're looking through their neighbor's pictures. And, and so then it became a big privacy concern. And as we moved into the cloud, we're like, man, he's, you know, this is a good way to increase the, the, the privacy of these pictures, you know, so they're not sitting out there in public at Walgreens or CVS or, or Walmart and so forth. So, but see, then that that ushered in a new set of challenges because now you're in the public internet, right? Almost now the public internet's coming along. Everything is shareable, mineable. So now a whole set of new challenges arises. Like, how do we keep that data private? Now, at that point in time, nobody's even really thinking about this. Okay, but we began to think about it. Okay, and then. You know, as I get further in my career in, in, in marketing, I'm the channel digital marketing. Um, you know, the whole game of that is we use a word called REAR. It's an acronym, R-E-A-R. Uh, the game is to reach, engage, activate, and re-communicate. It's a good word for people to remember because that's kind of how all marketing works, right? So, um, and then... Early on, you know, let's say TV or print advertising or out-of-home advertising, you could reach, but you had a very difficult time engaging people. You, you couldn't measure the extent to which somebody was really engaged in a TV ad or a print ad or an out-of-home ad in Yankee Stadium or something, okay? And you couldn't really measure accurately to what extent you activated them, got them to take action. And then you couldn't really re-communicate, like, like with who's watching my TV ads or looking at my print ads in Sports Illustrated. So um, that, that, you know, then as, as the internet marketing evolved, right, internet marketing now comes along and it begins to solve that problem, which is what caused it to explode. Okay, reach, activate, um, you know, reach, engage, activate, and re-communicate. Okay, so that's all, that's, wow, that's great. This, this internet marketing thing is, is fantastic. You know, this is, a, this is the answer to the riddle. You know, reach, engage, act, activate, and, and re-communicate. But you spend a lot of money to do that. Okay, now, see, this is where it gets crazy. Um, and so what has begun to dawn on people, those leads, call them leads, 
you know, brand Avids leads the, I'm spending a lot of money to do this, right. right? This is not, these are not private to me. Everything I'm doing here, it's dawning on people, everything I'm doing in omnichannel digital, you know, public internet advertising, it's all being mined and being shared with your competitors, right? And not, not just your competitors, with anybody who wants to mine the data and use it against you for whatever reason. So that's kind of where we're at today. Yeah, and I, I want to I want to think about something there real quick, John, because it reminds me of a Robin Williams movie. I think it was back in like 2002 or 2003. It was called One Hour Photo. Yeah. And if for anybody who's not seen the movie, the the premise is he is he is behind the counter of a photo uh, development, you know, Walgreens or whatever. I don't want to say any specific name, but that type of environment, and he is looking at people's photos and yeah, collecting yeah. photos that don't belong to him. Right. There and you go. I, I think that there is this assumption and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that there is this kind of assumption, just like we assumed back in those days that, you know, those photos were private. They were safe when we drop them off there. We assume that when we get online, when we do collect leads, when we do these things, we're making the assumption that things are just safe. We're trusting <laughs> the, the big internet to be safe for us. I got to give you the high fives. You've summed it up. Really. <laughs> and, well, and, and what I think, you know, is, is really important about what you're talking about here is that, you know, there are so many things I've got a, uh, a friend who, uh, and I'll leave the, the name of States and whatnot out, but uh, putting it simply, he works uh, in, with one of the like major electric companies in the South. And he is part of a, a like 15 or 20 member team that spend their days literally battling off uh, all of these bad actors that are trying to penetrate through the grid and, you know, wreak havoc on the power. <laughs> um, so with that being, being said, you, you come at this from kind of that unique angle with Kodak. How, how do you kind of bridge that gap as, as you, you know, bring that, those lessons that we learned early on in the, you know, the early onset of the internet, 2000, 2008, when social media, how do you bridge that gap to where we are finding ourselves right now? The average marketer out there that, you know, is doing the good work of trying to just collect the leads, reach out, you know, the engage and, and re-engage. Um, how do you bridge that gap for somebody? Because we're not thinking about that. Now people, now it, your analogy is perfect about, you know, trust, right? The, the, the trust that existed, you know, 20 years ago with how you, you took pictures, right? And, and right. you went into more greens and dropped them off and they ended up at, you know, the prints were in the little bag and set, it sits there on a wide open table with a with hundred other little bags and all the people in your neighborhood, right? So, so the, and people, they didn't give it a second thought until all of a sudden, like the movie that you're talking about comes out and other people start to ask questions and they're like, wait a second, I'm not sure if this is private here, right? So that's kind of where we're at. That, that's a great analogy. That's kind of where we're at with the public internet marketing now, right? So there's, um, you got to bring awareness to it or people are not going to do anything about it, right? Exactly. But what we try to tell people, <clears throat> a lot of it, the root cause of a lot of the privacy is all the tracker codes that are embedded on all the web pages, right? And that's, you know, that's really the root cause. And what we try to show people and explain to them, you, you don't have to have those tracker codes there. And it's not like fundamentally essential to have them. They, they serve a certain purpose, right? Um, but if I'm watching, I mean, I'm going to give you an analogy, right? Because we, I've done a lot of background in TV advertising and print and radio and all form, you know, digital and you name it, right? With big companies, you know, the Gillettes of the World and Procter and Gamble's, Unilever, Wilson Sporting Goods, um, you know, where the marketing departments would report to me, and, and I'd have to manage the budgets, right? So I've got to worry about all this stuff. Um, and so a lot of it's ROI. You know, you're looking for ROI, ROI per touch point. Like I want to know the ROI for every print ad. I want to do every TV ad, every out of home ad in an airport, train station, everything. I want to measure everything, right? And I, I want relationships with consumers. That's what I want, or B two B. So that's what I'm paying for. So what we, if, but see, when you watch a TV ad, I give you a simple analogy that's completely unnecessary. 
when we talk to, you know, like even pharma companies, um, you know, or BMW, Mercedes, they run a print ad or they run a TV ad, right? And on the bottom of the, on the bottom of the, of the TV ad, go to our website or, or follow us on social media, right? You see it all the time. Well, okay. The consumer has already found you. They found you. Okay. They've, they're not searching for it. They found you. They're staring at your print ad. They're staring at your TV ad. They're staring at your out of home ad. They have found you. That's a lead. That's very valuable. You paid a lot of money for it. Why do you want to, why do you want to share that lead with the public internet? Why do you want to do that? So that all of your competitors or bad guys, uh, now have the same lead. They can recommunicate with that same person that you paid a lot of money to reach, right? To, see, it's kind of illogical. It, there, there's a great movie that I want to that I often use a, as an analogy here. If anybody, if you, if anybody listening has ever seen the movie Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, famous movie, Academy Award winning, uh, starring Jack Lemmon, and there's a scene in the movie which is easy to find. Uh, you know, on the internet, it just punch in Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, the the leads leads the leads discussion, it, and it, it it it's used by people like us to prove the point because what that little scene's about it's about a two minute long scene with Jack Lemon, and he's yelling and screaming at his boss that you got to give me better leads. Like I, I have to have better leads. My, my my job, my my wife, my marriage, everything is dependent upon me having better leads. And the boss is saying, "Well, I, I give the good leads. But I have to pay for them. I go buy them. I pay for them, and I give them to my best salespeople. You're not one of my best salespeople. So, but if you think of how crazy it is with the public internet, they're just leads. All these engagement, they're leads, and you pay a lot of money for them." Why do you want to share them with your competitors? You know, it's right. not necessary. You don't have to do that. And, and let's, we let's people. level. Well, let's level with people on a on a scale of one to five for the right person, for the person who knows how to do this. How easy is it for somebody to gain access to those valuable leads that someone it's, else has? It's not every agency in Chicago or New York and probably even Indiana, Indianapolis, every agency. That's how the agency world, the advertising agency world. That is how they operate, and and that's how they measure their performance. They measure their performance on the basis of reach. How many people did I reach, right? How many people did I engage? Then they play with the metrics, and this is what Elon Musk has been talking about with Twitter. It's like these aren't even real people. These are robots here. You know, it's it's infested. That was the see. That was the big thing he he was talking about. With when he made the acquisition to buy Twitter. And once he got further into it, it was actually too late. He realized that they don't have this many people in their audience. They only may, they may only have 30% of the number that they're claiming. What am I buying? The rest are robots, right? So that that's this horrendous world that, that a lot of the big advertising agencies are perpetuating, right? They're literally perpetuating this and, and they're driving up the metrics, and that's that's their scorecard. It's changing now. Okay, there's a lot of people out there saying, "I'm not going to like like Elon Musk. I'm not going to pay." Okay, the the uh, CFO of Procter and Gamble. Okay, the number largest marketer, advertiser, probably most sophisticated in the world. Um, in a Wall Street conference call, he said, "We are tired of spending our precious." advertising dollars to advertise to robots. I mean, he said that in a Wall Street earnings call, you know, and that was the point that he's making. You know, we got to find other ways to do And there are other ways. And you don't have to engage with these tracker codes. You know, the agencies want you to do it, okay, because they're kind of in the, they're collaborators in the mining of everybody's data, that, that they're just, they're part of the ecosystem. Um, and every, all, you know, all these companies, firms, are they're, they're, they're participating, they're, they're kind of colluding in this ecosystem um, that, that is really, uh, you know, a bit nefarious in terms of data mining, data sharing without consent. And that's where the, that's where the privacy laws are coming in. European Union's privacy laws, U.S. privacy laws. C consumers saying, hey, I didn't give you my consent. I opted in to Pfizer's, you know, 
vaccine, right? There's a TV ad for Pfizer. I opted into that. I didn't, and I, I did not give them my consent to share that data with the entire public internet ecosystem, right? But including life insurance companies, health insurance companies, lending institutions, and maybe curious as to what diseases I have, you know, what's my healthcare privacy risk in terms of bankruptcy risks. It's, that's the crazy world that, that, this is, that this is being used for. Yeah, you know, so full confession here. Several years ago, I was getting phone calls. Clearly, uh, you know, I'd been targeted on a marketing list. And so I, I created a false name. <laughs> Good for you. And it's like, yeah, it's like a VPN, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, so here's the funny thing about that. And I, I, just to your point, that name throughout the years has, has went through several iterations. So I get phone calls for that name now. And so <laughs> I then I say, it. no. No, you, you know, you've not reached that person, but I'll change the last name. You've actually reached this. And then sure enough, three, six months later, I get a phone call with the new name and adjustment. <laughs> Good. So, I love it. So, That's great. So I, yeah, to, to your point, like this happens that you, you and I have talked a little bit because I think that this, first of all, this is an entirely huge conversation, but you know, you and I have talked about how these bots are not only, you know, in, just messing with everything from marketing, but you know, we're talking about major influence in the market. And I would love for you, if you would just touch a little bit on how, what we'll call bad actors, you know, leverage these bots for influence, uh, you know, whether that's in business, whether that's in politics, but how these are being leveraged against us and, and maybe what are some of the things that <laughs> we need to be paying attention to? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, you're into, I mean, you're into a big thing now, what you've just talked about. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. everybody thinks it's just about advertising. Oh, like I didn't give you permission to reach me, you know, about that drug, right? Or that pair of running shoe. Okay, that's just a part of it. Okay, now, and I, I'm going to expand upon that. And anybody that's listening can research this. Okay, Re look at a company, the, the name of this Venture capital firm is called Digital Sky Technologies. D is in David, S as in Sam, T as in technology. Okay, DST. Anybody can do this. Look up now. The owner of the firm, uh, primary shareholder owner, was a fellow by the name of Yuri Milner. Okay. Now they are viewed by many <clears throat> as being Russia's number one venture capital firm, collaborating firm, okay? And you can, you can go on the internet and look all this up. Now, they put, back when Facebook didn't have much money and it was questionable whether Facebook's going to survive or not, they put $1.2 billion into Facebook. Wow. Okay, they put $500 million into Twitter. Okay, they put $300 million into Groupon. Every, and you can, you can pull it up when you do the research, anybody's listening, and you'll see all the other American social media companies they invested in. Okay, why would they? These are not marketing people. Why would they do that? Okay, why has China invested so much money in TikTok? Okay, the reason for it, not the sole reason, okay, because they do a lot of advertising and all this other, other stuff, but it's, see, back to reach, the, think of the word reach, engage, activate, and recommunicate. Okay, there is nothing that our geopolitical enemies, the USA's geopolitical enemies would like to do more than create social societal unrest and anarchy inside of America, to pit the right against the left, the left against the right, riots at the Capitol, riots in Michigan Avenue and downtown Chicago. They like that. OK, that, that and then they show that on their newsreels at home, you know, in Beijing or Moscow or Iran or North Korea. OK, and then they say, you think America is so great. Well, America is not so great. Look at these videos. This is how great America is. Uh, there's a quote by Vladimir Lenin that's interesting. People can look up. And it really sums this up, I will tell you. It, the quote is this about the capitalists. The capitalists will 
eventually sell us the rope that we will use to hang them. Okay. Now, what a lot of people are saying now, political scientists and technologists are saying, the rope that they're buying are shares in our internet and social media companies. That is the rope that they're buying that they will use to hang us. So every time I see the riots in the streets in America and the storming of the Capitol and all this other chaos, smash and grabs and all this stuff in you know, downtown San Francisco, I think of that quote. And, and if you read the root cause, these are being coordinated for the most part on social media. Okay, social media. And back to what I said a minute ago, so why did they invest so much money, these people, in American social media companies? Okay, I, I, t to me, I think, well, that's probably why. That was their dream. Their dream would be how to be able to communicate and manipulate, okay, and activate American citizens, one against the other. And, and that's, in the opinion of a lot of people, that's really what they're doing today. Yeah. And, and it's with the, you know, with the advent of social media, it has become so easy, so incredibly easy to be misled because our emotions ride social media. You know, we, we talked about it early on when people were, we were seeing that there were waves of depression through adults in the United States because they were keying into Facebook uh, and then what became Instagram and seeing all of these highlight reels of their friends. And we became emotionally invested in social media. And we said, why isn't my life like that? My life should be like so-and-so's life. Why, yeah. what am I lacking? You're exactly right. And we become emotionally invested in it. So that way, when Russian disinformation, whatever disinformation that has been put out there to act on those emotions, when that hits my feed, I'm already primed. I'm already ready to jump on it. I'm already exactly. ready to believe it. And I love your point there. So let's, let's kind of talk a little bit that, about that and kind of start to work our way to the other side of this. Now, what are some of the things when we talk about privacy laws and we talk about just, and I know this is a, a big, uh, you know, can of worms to, to open here, but privacy laws and our own, individual daily practices, whether we're in marketing, whether we're, you know, growing a business, whether we're just using the internet for our own private, uh, you know, uses, what are some of the things that we need to be aware of and be paying attention to so that we can start to become better protected in our own use? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I we tell people when we speak at events or in college classrooms, uh, don't put anything on the internet that you don't want on the scoreboard at Yankee Stadium. Okay. You know, where, you know what I mean? It's just just assume that it's on the scoreboard at Yankee Stadium. So be, before you put it before you say it on the internet, you know, and it makes people think they laugh a little bit, but it makes them think. Uh we used to say, you know, when I was a kid in the town I lived in, we would say, you know, our families would talk about, do not say anything in this town that you don't want on the walls of the post office, you know, like when you're a kid, right? <laughs> Put things that get posted on the walls in the post office, you know, they had like a series of bulletin boards there. So it's kind of the same way. We say you just have to, like, just, you, you got to be careful what you say on the internet now. And, you know, so that that is the starting point. We also say, um, I mean, people, a lot of people use VPNs, you know, virtual private networks. That, that will certainly help. I, we, we, are, we encourage people, even in marketing, to, to use SMS texting. That's something we can all do. And it, it's a great substitute for most of what we do on the public Internet, including marketing, you know. So. Yes. Uh, I, I just want to talk about DigiBridge for a minute because, I, first of all, I think the past 30 or so minutes, everyone – uh, can really get a feel for where your area of expertise is. But now let's take us into DigiBridge. And, and can you just tell us, you know, in a few minutes, uh, what it is that DigiBridge does and how you all do it there? I mean, we're, you know, I don't want to turn this into like a pitch for DigiBridge. And I won't do that. But, you know, we, we are a privacy-focused uh, 
marketing communication technology and cybersecurity, digital cybersecurity company. And that's really who we are. So we are, we can you know, manage entire omnichannel uh, digital marketing campaigns. We transform all touch points. Um, sounds kind of crazy, but we believe that every touch point, TV, ad, print, radio, out of home, brochure, business cards, they're just touch point. They should be opt in. Uh, mobile video interactive um, and, and and the the private channels that are created there by the opting in person uh, should not be mineable. That's the big key. It's a lead and it should not be mineable. You should not be handing off and sharing that lead with your competitors or nefarious uh, enemies of yours, you know? Absolutely. So that's what we do. That's great. Well, John, I want to thank you. I, I have a feeling that this is only the beginning of conversations that you and I will have. These are huge topics. Today, we took a kind of a 30,000 foot view of it. But um, I, I hope that we can reconnect at some point and dive in deeper on some of these as well. Oh, I, I would love to. I mean, I think I think we could, you know, we really could help a lot of people that are listening. You know, that's my main goal, quite frankly, to create awareness for this challenge, you know, this kind of digital privacy revolution, create awareness for it and maybe offer some thoughts that would be helpful to people. Absolutely. And I, I also want to kind of wrap this up by saying, don't be scared. Don't be scared. The internet is a great place out there. We've got good people like John and his team and others out there who are working day in and day out to make sure we stay safe. So John, again, thank you so much for what you do and for helping to, to spread some awareness today. Yeah. Hey, listen, thank you for inviting me to be a guest. It was a pleasure and let's keep in touch for sure. 